It was Friday afternoon, and Jesus is dead. His brutalized body hanging without life on a cross dropped into a hole in the dirt. His executioners had dug the holes, prepared the place, and done their job with ruthless efficiency. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. The hope of mankind overcome by powers of hell, by the shadow of a grave. We once knew what it was like to rule and reign on the earth. We were made to live in the light, in a relationship, in purpose. We were made for more than what we've come to accept as normal. Ever since the garden, Satan and his kingdom have been tightening their grip. Darkness has ruled evil, chaos, suffering, hopelessness. We've been enslaved and crippled by the holes the enemy has been digging for us too. But instead of killing the Messiah, the cross became a catalyst for salvation. The hole that was dug to hold an instrument of shame and death was instead filled with an instrument to bring healing and new life. That's the way God is. Nothing is impossible with him. He's always restoring, always renewing, always able to take what was meant for evil and turn it for good, to take our graves and turn them into gardens. Why? Because he never gave up on his plan. He has never given up on us. He knows what we don't, that you can't have resurrection life without death, Jesus. He died so we can have lives of purpose and power over the grave. He is not dead, he is alive. And because he lives, we can live again. Hallelujah, come on Impact Church, happy Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah, come on, stand up on your feet if you're able this morning. We are gonna celebrate the risen King, hallelujah.
your voice for the risen king hallelujah hallelujah he died and rose for you he died and rose for me hallelujah that's the reason to give the lord some praise this morning come on hallelujah glory to your name oh god you are worthy king you are the risen king oh god hallelujah
Say you took all my sickness, depression, my sadness, my fear, and you rose for me. Say, God, you took all my pain, my suffering, my anger, my hate. God, you rose for me. Say, God, you took all my sadness, my angst, my fear, my distress. God, you rose for me. Say, God, you took all my I don't know about you, but this day for me is like my day to remember my victory. And so listen, let's join in this together. This is the day to remember our victory. No matter what you've done, no matter what's coming against you, this is the day that you take your victory lap for what Jesus did for you. So as we take a moment just to just get in God's presence, for a few more moments. Just give God praise. Lord, we love you. Lord, we are so thankful. We are so, so grateful for everything that you have done for me. He has forgiven me. He has healed you. He has delivered you. No enemy can hold you down. I feel it in my heart just to just say this. And when I get this, I just got to go with it. You have to forgive yourself to receive what God has for you. Does that make sense? You got to forgive yourself because Jesus already paid the price. The enemy wants to put the thoughts in your head and make you think on, oh, God is mad at you. God is not mad at you. Why would he send Jesus Christ to die for you if he was mad at you? So listen, no enemy's going to hold me down. No fear. What does she say? Nothing is going to hold me down. So let's take 10, no, let's take a moment just to give God just the utmost praise, the loudest praise. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. Father, we are so gracious. No enemy can hold me down. No fear, no depression, no anxiety, no sickness. No enemy can hold me down. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord. Man, that's powerful. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful for this day. Let's give it up for the praise and worship team. Oh, man, that is awesome. I want to just take a moment, family, just to acknowledge all of our guests that are with us today. If you're watching us online or if you are actually in the auditorium, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time on Resurrection Sunday to come and fellowship with us. I appreciate you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching us online, what I need you to do is text the word ICNEW, that's ICNEW, to 97000. We're going to give you a digital connection card. And if you're here in the auditorium, we have a connection card that should be in the seat pocket directly in front of you. Take a moment to fill that connection card out. And at the end of service, what's going to happen is take that to the welcome desk as soon as you exit out the door. And what's going to happen is once you get that completed card to our, those at the welcome desk, they're going to give you one of our impact swag bags. So, again, we thank you so much for coming out. Let's give them a big hand and show them that we appreciate them being with us today. So, family, listen, as you stand back up to your feet, we're going to take 30 seconds. Go to your neighbor around the room and just greet them. This is family time. For those that are watching us on the chat, say hello and tell us where you're watching from.
Before the dawn of creation, there was the Word. Before the beginning had begun, before the planet spun and the sun hung in the sky, there was the Word. He was the light, and the light was alive, giving life to all things, everything. No thing was created except through Him. And in His image, He created them, us in his likeness to reflect the light and be just like him. But sin came on the scene and everything went dark. Not even a spark left. We were hard pressed for a savior. He had offered us his love in exchange for our trust, but we could not live up to his standard of perfection. We were dejected, broken, hostile, hopeless, but this is the gospel we put our hope in, that God, in his endless wisdom, fashioned the word into flesh, and he pitched his tent in the midst of our mess, and the rest is history. The mystery of the cross, the incalculable cost of his life in exchange for our imperfection, the beauty of his resurrection, giving us life in exchange for his death when we call upon his name, Jesus giver of grace, purveyor of peace, master of mercy, the word, the one who bore the scars that we deserve. Have you heard the gospel, the good news, not what you can do for God, but what he has done for you. It is finished. God's plan since before the beginning, the greatest story ever written, broken by sin, but restored when we surrender to the word. This is the gospel. Have you heard? We serve a mighty God. We serve a God who died for us, who gave us everything when he died on the cross. He healed us from our diseases and every affliction, God. We thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus.
Listen, there is no name like Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Somebody sing the name that forgave you of all your sins. Jesus. Sing the name that can heal every disease. Jesus, 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 call on you, Jesus, we worship you, Jesus, there's no name like Jesus, there's no name like Jesus. Resurrection Day Impact Church. Listen, we're not just working up emotion here. Jesus really is alive. We're celebrating the day that he came back to life. His heart started pumping again. Blood was running through his veins. His brain was fully functional. And three days before, he was dead. He, wasn't, he didn't just look dead. He didn't just play dead. Jesus was dead, and he raised from the dead. And the good news is, he's still alive today. I got to tell you, two years ago today, my dad went into the hospital and physically he never came home. Four or five days later, he went home to be with the Lord. And this morning, God was speaking to my heart. And he, he gave me this scripture that I sent to my siblings where Jesus was talking to Martha. And she had just experienced the death in her family and it was breaking her. It was, it was destroying her heart. And Jesus said, don't you believe? She was like, yeah, Jesus, I know that the dead will raise on the last day. He said... Martha, I am the resurrection. Anybody that believes in me will never die. And it spoke to me this morning. I'm celebrating the resurrection of Jesus because when he raised from the dead, everything dead in my life had to come to life. Everything that, that submits to the name of Jesus comes to life. Let's just honor it one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you, Lord Jesus for going through what you went through so that we could have victory. Give it up for our worship team. Amazing job, y'all. Let's give a big shout out to everybody that's watching online. Thank you guys for tuning in to Impact Church's Easter Sunday service 2024. I'm also giving a shout out to some folks that are watching the screen right over to my left in <laughs> in our uh, vault area in Overflow. Thank you guys for, for being here and watching the, uh, the, the Overflow broadcast instead of getting back in the car. Um, thank you all for being here, even though y'all came late. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to talk too much about why you in Overflow. No, I, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> you just came early for the 12 o'clock. I get it. I understand. A uh, couple announcements before we, uh, before we jump in to the service, uh, to the message today. Um, number one, if you're a guest and somebody brought you to church today, I want to say thank you for saying yes. It is a little awkward sometimes to invite somebody to church. But as the pastor, I gave all of our, all of our folks a, a challenge to invite somebody because this isn't just community. It's an amazing community. Church is just, I mean, it's great community, but it's not just community. We believe this stuff. Like, we really believe Jesus is the solution to what you've been going through. And so I want to say welcome to every single person that's here because of an invitation. And I salute every single one of you that brought somebody, that invited somebody with you. Um, our normal service time on Sunday is 9 and 11. We added an additional service so that we could make room. We tried. We did the best we could to make room. Um, for. But our normal services are 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Welcome you to come back any given Sunday. Um, also, this is the first week of April coming up. And so during the first week of every month, we have corporate prayer on Saturday and first Wednesday service. So I encourage you to uh, mark your calendars for that this Saturday at 8 a.m., 
prayer is important. Doing your private personal prayer is critically important that you have time where you just talk to your Heavenly Father. But it's also important that we join together corporately. The scripture says in Matthew chapter 18 that when two or more are gathered together in prayer, that Jesus would be in that group as well and he would make good what we ask. There's power in agreement. And so on the first Saturday of every single month, we receive communion together. We pray for each other. We pray together. And it's powerful, y'all. So I encourage you this Saturday to come to a Saturday prayer. And then next Wednesday to come to our first, uh, first Wednesday service. It's not our first first Wednesday. It's our fourth first Wednesday. It's confusing when you say first Wednesday. But the first Wednesday of every month. So come this Wednesday. And I hope that you all will do that. Um, uh, that that's, that's it for the announcements. I want to I wanna go ahead and pray. Because we're going to open the, the living word. We believe that the scripture is alive. That's what the Bible says about itself. That, that all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. And that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for ex, uh, uh, instruction in righteousness. And so the, the scripture is alive. That it's, it's a living, breathing document. Which means when we're reading it, it's also reading us. So we want to pray for that right now. Father, in Jesus' name, it's Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Day. We're celebrating the life of Jesus. While at the same time, many of us, Lord, are experiencing grief, depression, drama, confusion, despair. But Jesus, we believe that you are the answer. You actually said that your word is truth, that your word is life, and that if we would continue in your word, that we would know the truth, and the truth would make us free. God, I pray in Jesus' name, watching online right here in the room, in overflow, that we're about to hear some truth and it's going to hit our heart and it's going to transform us. It's going to make us new. It's going to bring us into a place of freedom in our relationships, in our finances, in our physical body. But more important than all of that, in our spiritual relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to take notes, you don't have to because I'm going to give you my notes for free. Impact. DET.com is our new website. We just launched our new website, ImpactDET.com. If you put a slash on it and put notes, ImpactDET or, or ImpactDET.com forward slash notes, you can get <coughs> you can get my actual notes um, and follow along with me. I encourage you to do that. Let's look at our first uh, our first scripture in Hebrews chapter ten, verse one. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 in the New Living Translation says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow. Say, only a shadow. It says the old system, the old testament, the old covenant was only a shadow, a dim preview. Say, dim preview. Only a shadow, only a dim preview of the good things to come. Not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. I like to understand the scripture that I read, so I want to read that one more time. It says the old system, the old covenant, the, the old testament that we see, Genesis through Malachi, it says the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of good things to come, not the good things themselves. Say, not the good things. Genesis through, Genesis through Matthew is good, but it's a good preview. It's not the good things themselves. Whatever it is that you read in Genesis through Malachi is great. It's God-breathed, but it's a preview. Um, a couple weeks ago, maybe even a week ago, my wife and I, we do date nights. And a lot of times we go out to eat for date nights. But sometimes we just do our date night at the crib. We lock the door. We tell the kids we on the date, leave me alone. And they can beep on the door and we just act like we're not there, right? But what we decide to do during our, our, our at-home <laughs> at home date nights is we, we, uh, we want to watch like Netflix or, or Amazon Prime and try to find a movie that we've never seen before. But we usually don't just, you know, pick a movie. We watch the trailer first. We watch the preview. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever done this, but this happened to us recently where we were watching so many previews, we looked up and the whole date was basically over. <laughs> you intended to watch the movie, but you got caught up in the trailer. And I want you to understand that this is what happened to the generation that, that, that Jesus was born into, that, that the Old Testament was just a preview. The law was just a trailer. It was not the good thing. This was just to whet their appetite for what God was about to do. But the religious leaders, because they benefited from the law, they, they got a position that they fell in love with. And they fell in love with the trailer, with the preview, with the dim preview. It's not even a good preview. He said it's just a dim preview 
They fell in love with it so much so that they stopped looking forward to the world premiere. They stopped looking forward to the premiere of the chosen one. That's what Messiah or Christ means. It means chosen one or anointed one. It, they stopped looking forward to the Messiah because they got really comfortable with the trailer. In fact, they started to study the trailer. They got de degrees on, on mastering the trailer. They knew the trailer forward and back, but it was just a dim preview. In fact, the scripture we just read said the sacrifices under that system didn't even do what you were hoping it would do. It said the sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, going back and forth to the temple, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those that used it for worship. So they had this religion that God gave them. God gave them this religion. This was The religion was just to hold them over, though. It was really just to whet their appetite, to make them look forward to the Christ. Religion in and of itself is, is supposed to be just a temporary bridge until you meet the maker, until you actually meet the creator. You don't need religion anymore when you meet Jesus. When you actually find the one that created the religion, you can throw the religion away because what you have now is a relationship with the living God. But the, but, but the trailer was so attractive, especially to those that got a position out of the trailer. They got a position because of this dim preview. They fell in love with it. So instead of actually connecting with the real thing, they just, they just connected with the, with the shadow. Another example of a shadow that I wrote down, and, and this is really relevant, especially for Generation Z, there's this thing called YouTube. And YouTube is set up so that you can actually watch other people live a life. Without having a life yourself, you can watch somebody else and almost feel like you have a life. You don't have a life, but you can feel like. I'm, just, I'm, I'm really teasing the kids that watch YouTube. They watch YouTube instead of TV. When I was growing up, we had TV shows that we looked forward to. We came home after school and we knew the lineup. We knew DuckTales was coming on. And you looked forward to it. On, on Friday, you had something called TGIF, and you knew Family Matters was coming on. On Thursday night, you used to have the Cosby show, and you would set your, 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 your life set up so that you can watch that show. Now, you just watch YouTube, and YouTube isn't even really syndicated anyway. You're just watching other people live their lives. I, I get frustrated when my, when my kids watch a kid play a game that they actually have. And like hours, like, oh, no, 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 they're watching somebody else live life, but you don't actually have a life. And that is what it's like if you get stuck with just religion. You're watching something that you were supposed to participate in. You're, you're observing something, and you can't actually get the, the cleansing that you're supposed to get and the, the, the uplifting that you're supposed to get, the healing that you're supposed to get. You miss all of that if you're only watching it. You're seeing the shadow. You're seeing the dim preview. Instead of looking forward to the world premiere of the chosen one, the Christ, the Messiah, too many people fell in love with the trailer, which is religion. And I want to show you Exodus chapter 29, verse 36 and 37, what they did in this old system, in this, this preview of what God was working on. Exodus 29, 36 through 37 in the NIV. I know y'all wondering, like, what is he going to do with this bow and arrow? Like, when do we get to that part? I'm going to actually, like, fire it at people just so you know it's, it's coming. <laughs> Exodus 29, verse 36 through 37 says, sacrifice a bull. Each day as a sin offering to make atonement. Say atonement. It says purify the altar by making atonement. I'm going to tell you what the word atonement means in Hebrew in a moment. And anoint it to consecrate it. For seven days make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar will be most holy and whatever touches it will be holy. This is a small passage that's pulled out of some instructions that God gave Moses so that they could make these unholy people holy enough to serve as leaders. It was a God-given religion. It was supposed to just be a babysitter until Jesus came. But, but what they did is, because this, this process of atonement actually put me in a position where I'm different than everybody else. I've been sprinkled by the blood. I've actually been purified. I've been consecrated. These folks fell in love with their position, and I'm going to show you how it separated them from what God was really trying to do in the earth. 
The word translated atonement is the Hebrew word kafar, which literally means to cover or to cover up. This is actually the word that is, that is used when God told Noah to build the ark. Remember Noah's ark? When he told him to build the ark, he told him to atone it or cover it up with pitch. In other words, this pitch over the wood is going to protect the wood from the water. So I want you to cover it up. And religion is all about the cover up. And, and, and what they got good at in that season, in this limited time, was covering up. They fell in love with a religion that was all about atonement, covering up. It's still there. The dirt you did is still there, but it's covered up. And I've grown up in church my whole life, so I understand the cover up. I understand how to look the part. I understand how to look like you're okay when you've fallen apart. I understand how you can say when somebody asks you, how you doing? I'm blessed. Highly favor, empowered to prosper. Favor goes before me and prospers my way. Can I borrow $5 real quick? <laughs> Can you give me a ride to the check cashing spot? Because really the truth is I'm not okay, but I learned how to cover up. I've learned how to make it look like me and my wife are okay, and we smile when we get out the car to come to church and we hold hands, and one of us is squeezing the other person's hand because really we're mad, but we're acting because we're covering up because that's what religion is good at. Religion is wonderful at covering up so that you can pretend that you're better than other people. So you you can make yourself feel like, at least I don't. And you pick somebody else's issue, somebody else's vice, somebody else's drama, and at least I don't. But that's just a cover-up. The reality is you know the truth. You need a savior. You're a mess. Can I tell you the real truth? We all a mess. You ain't even got to cover it up. Every single one of us from the wall to the wall, the pastor to to the infant, we all are in need of a savior. I wrote this quote down that religion covers but never cleans. Religion hides, but rarely heals. So I invite you to trade in religion for a relationship with the chosen one, with the risen Lord Jesus, because he doesn't just cover, he cleans. He doesn't just hide. He doesn't have to hide it. He can heal it. So this this, uh, passage we're about to read is a standoff. One of many standoffs that Jesus had with the religious leaders that fell in love with the with the trailer, with the preview, and he had this standoff, and they hated him because of standoffs like this. And Jesus, because he's the executive producer, the writer, he's the author and the finisher of our faith, he's the one that wrote the movie. He doesn't need to worry about the trailer. They mastered the trailer, and they tried to judge him based on the trailer, and he's like, listen, you think you know what you're talking about, but you need to go see the movie. John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11, New Living Translation, kind of a long passage, but... But it's interesting. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple, and a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Say caught. I don't know if you've ever been caught, but it's, it's uncomfortable, and she was caught in the act of adultery. That word caught is going to be important in a moment. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. The law of Moses says to stone her. There's a scripture that says that she should be condemned, but what do you say? Are you going to contradict the law of Moses? Are you going to contradict scripture? Pharisees love to pull out a scripture. When really the gospel is compassionate, the gospel is good news, the gospel is here to help somebody that's in trouble. But a Pharisee just loads their scripture. Oh, so you got divorced? Dang, that's messed up. Oh, man, that must hurt, right? Here, let me pray for you. Psych! The scripture says thou shalt not get divorced. (laughs) You're in debt? Let me see if I can help you. Psych! The scripture says thou shalt not covet. (laughs) The next one coming at you, yeah. Pharisees always want to load a scripture. They had real legitimate preview trailer scripture. They had scripture, and and yet the scripture was never meant to be used as a weapon for the the goody two-shoes, holier than thou, for you to look at somebody else's life, look at somebody else's issues, and load a scripture and then fire it at them. So they said, we got a scripture. The law of Moses says... She's wrong that she should be stoned. What do you say? And they were trying to trap him. 
into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Can I, as your pastor, give you some advice? You don't have to answer somebody just because they ask you a question. I don't owe you a response in your time when you feel like it. Jesus is a G, man. And he's, he stooped down, and he's just right in the middle of it. They brought this whole scene. They dragged this lady. They threw her in front of them. And they like, now nah, what do you have to say? He acted like they wasn't even there. And he just got down and started writing in the sand. They kept demanding an answer. So he must have did that for a while. When he was ready, he stood up and again and said, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest. That's interesting. Beginning with the oldest uh, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd. Why would the oldest leave first? Because Jesus said, listen, if you haven't committed any sin, and I'm looking at all of y'all like, okay, if you're perfect, you throw the first stone. The, old, the longer you've been around, the more you like, listen, I already know I'm disqualified. Y'all just, y'all go ahead. I don't know how he came up with that. I do know it was the Holy Spirit. God gave him the perfect answer because the reality is they're trying to trap Jesus. If Jesus says, well, that's what the scripture says, go ahead and condemn them. Then they can go to Rome and say, Jesus is out here stoning people. But if, they, but if he says, no, I'm, I'm compassionate, Jesus, and I don't have a scripture for it, but no, don't condemn her. Because the scripture says condemn her, then, then they can say, ah, he's a blasphemer. He, told, he said, don't do what the scripture says. They're trying to trip him up. But if, if, if the first person that throws the stone says, okay, I'm without sin, I throw the stone, now I'm condemning myself. Because if I ever get caught that I've sinned, then I should get the same punishment. He set them up. It was perfect. Listen, the, the religious community's issue is not that this lady committed adultery. Adultery is bad. Oh, the Bible says don't commit adultery. All them jokers were adulterers. Don't you think it's interesting that they only brought the lady? Where's the dude? People don't commit adultery by themselves. There should be two of them laying together, huddled up, about to get stoned. It probably was one of y'all that you actually just, how is it that you caught her? Where were you at? What corner was you snooping in? So you could catch, you know, Pharisees are so fixated in finding something wrong with you that they miss what God is trying to deal with them about in their own life. Watch how Jesus responds. He, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? She said, no, Lord. Not even one of them. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. She, was, she had sinned. She was caught. She was an adulteress. And the Bible says, the Bible, the scripture, the scripture says that she was supposed to be condemned. But Jesus says, I disagree. Wait a minute. Now you're messing with my religion because the scripture says to stone her, how can you say you don't condemn her if the scripture condemns her? And Jesus says, you only think that because you saw the trailer. You need to understand I wrote the movie. I understand when the scripture says that anybody that sins deserves death. I wasn't just talking about the adulterer. I wasn't just talking about the liar. I wasn't just talking about the drunkard. I was talking about you and your issues too. And since everybody deserves death, somebody sinless is going to have to pay for it all. But you wouldn't understand it unless you see the full picture. It's just a dim preview of what God was working on. They fell in love with religion instead of God himself. And they perverted atonement, which is covering sin, into a religion of hypocrisy, which is wearing a mask. Hypocrisy actually comes from a Greek word that means wearing a mask like a masquerade. And they turned this religion that God gave them temporarily and they perverted it so that now it's all about just not getting caught. As long as your sin is covered. Do you remember where they, they, Jesus healed this man that was born blind? And, and the Pharisees, when, when Jesus healed him because he did it on the Sabbath, they said, you know, who is this man? How dare he do this on the Sabbath? Listen, you can't do it Monday through 
Sunday. So what difference does it make to you whether Jesus did it on the Sabbath? But they were so upset because they said, you know, Jesus shouldn't be doing this on the Sabbath. And the man said, listen, I don't know whether what day he was supposed to do it. All I can tell you is I was blind. Now I see. No, but, and they said, no, no, don't say that. Don't, 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 don't talk about Jesus like that. We know he's a sinner. He said, I don't know if he's a sinner. All I know is I was blind. I can see. Let me tell you what the real world, what the world is looking for is not a whole bunch of scriptures. I'm talking to my people, my Christians. The world is not interested in the fact that you can prove that abortion is wrong and homosexuality is wrong and fornication. Is, oh, you, li- you live with your boyfriend before you What? I got a scripture for that. The world don't care about your scripture, but they do care about results. If I was blind and now I see, now I understand something that I didn't see before. And your love for me can actually bring me to the cross. It can bring me to a place where I care about your God. But if all you're doing is firing arrows, you're just being a Pharisee. You're participating in a religion that's all about covering up. Because whatever it is that you're criticizing somebody else for, you are guilty of that same thing. Just in a different circumstance, but you're guilty of the same thing. The scripture says, judge not lest you be judged. When we judge, we're demonstrating that I know better, so I deserve the punishment that comes with it. Scripture says, just judge yourself so that you won't be judged. So Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. The scriptures are not arrows pointed at the lost from a bow of condemnation. In fact, I put it in quotes. This is, this is what scriptures are. Scriptures are not arrows pointed at the lost. The scriptures are arrows that point the lost to the cross. God never intended for these scriptures that we read. It was thou shalt not and thou shalt not. And you're thinking, man, this is arrows so God can get me on something. No, it's not supposed to demonstrate that you're a bad person. It's supposed to demonstrate that you're in a free fall and you need a parachute. God is so loving that he would tell us the truth. That you're already in a free fall. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to say, look around. You're in trouble. But there's a parachute right here. Pull a cord and you can be saved. Jesus' verdict was not condemned. I don't condemn you. Jesus' verdict is the same thing right now. It wasn't debatable whether or not she was a sinner, but Jesus wasn't tripping on the sin because he was the solution for sin. Can I tell you, if you're a believer but you have, have been living in a, in a bad situation that you are better than, that you know better than, that Jesus ain't tripping about the sin. What he's tripping about is your relationship. Would you stop doing what Adam and Eve did when you mess up? Don't run away from God. Don't go hide from him. Go walk with him. He got a solution for it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 again said, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow. It was a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4, I got to put you up on game. I need you to understand how this whole thing works. It says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. Say good news. It says they don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Why don't, <coughs> why don't they understand? Because they got help not understanding. Their help is coming from the God of this world. Now, God, Satan is not a real God. He's a, he's a pretend God. He's posing as God. He, and what you have if you have a dictator, somebody that's holding on to their power and they don't want to lose it, is they release what is called propaganda. And the propaganda is used to lead the public to believe something opposite of the truth. And here's the opposite of the truth. The devil wants you to believe that God is mad at you, that he's shooting these scripture arrows at you, that he's upset about this or that and what you've done but the the actual opposite is true God is not the one firing arrows at you but there is one that's firing arrows it's the enemy it's Satan he's the one that condemns the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren if you've ever felt so low and so worthless and so useless and guilty it wasn't God condemning you it's the enemy He's the one that fires these arrows at us, that tries to get us to walk away from God, that tries to get us to lose our confidence, that tries to get us to not believe that God has a future for us and and a hope for us. Listen, if you've ever heard a message about Jesus that wasn't good news, it's fake news. It's not real. 
The propagator of fake news is the enemy because he wants you to believe that God is your enemy because he knows God is so doggone good that if you just turn to him, he'll save you. He'll forgive you. He's made it easy. So the devil tries to make it so that you don't even want to go to church. You don't even want to listen to a podcast. You don't even want to ask somebody to pray for you because if you draw near to him, the Bible says God will draw near to you. I double dog dare you. Despite what your lifestyle is, despite what your issues are, despite all of the drama, I double-dog dare you just to surrender to God. Just say, God, listen, I don't know if you even want me, but if you want me, you can take me, but this is what I got. This is who I am. I dare you. The scripture says that everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody. Satan is this fake God firing arrows at you. But here's the good news. Ephesians chapter 6 Verse 16 says, above all, lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. He is firing arrows at you, but the good news is there is a shield that can block every single arrow the devil has in his arsenal. He doesn't, he hasn't made a weapon that can get through the shield of faith. The shield of faith is so out cold that it doesn't matter if it's sickness and disease. It doesn't matter if it's poverty. It doesn't matter if it's some vice in your past. Nothing can get through the shield of faith. The scripture says take that shield of faith above everything. I want to show you how to pick up that shield of faith right now. Scripture says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, you can't make up faith. You can't just decide, oh, I want to have faith. You have to go pick it up from somewhere. And the place, the store that you go to purchase faith is the word of God. That if you hear a promise from God and you believe it, it can produce faith. And that faith is a shield that no arrow the devil ever throws at you will get through. John chapter 3 verse 16 as we're closing. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Listen to the next verse. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. It was never Jesus' mission to fire arrows at people and remind us of our sin and remind us of how bad we were or just do what the religious people do and just cover it up for a little while. Jesus was done with the cover-up, and he said, I know that you're broken, and I know that you're messed up, and I know that you've disappointed yourself more than you disappointed anybody else, but I want you. I love you, and I'm going to give my life for you. I'm going to prove that I love you more than anybody could love you because I'm going to take what you did, and I'm going to put it on the cross. He was the only one that could do it. He was the only one that actually qualified to condemn people. Jesus said, let the first person that has no sin throw the stone. There was only one person standing there that had no sin. It was Jesus. The one person that should judge you won't judge you. The one person that could condemn you doesn't condemn you. It doesn't matter who you are and what you've done. Jesus' answer to this lady is his answer to you. I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. God does hate sin. But the reason he he hates sin is the reason that I hate heart disease. I hate heart disease because heart disease took my dad. I hate it. I hate the, the idea of, of, of a heart that God created to work, stop working. That bothers me. I, I hate it. That God hates sin because it takes people out. He hates sin because it destroys families. He hates sin because it causes people to die prematurely. He doesn't hate sin because he's some big bad judge just looking to show how wrong you are. He loves you. He wants you. He's already decided, I want you. Come just like you are. I'm going to do something with your life, and everybody's going to know that I'm God. He loves you that much. The old system only covered up sin with religious performance. Jesus' blood, though, is the genuine article. It's what the trailer was actually previewing, that that they go to a temple and they go through this religious performance where they sacrifice an animal and the animal sheds blood and we get to pretend like we're okay, but we're really not okay. We know we're guilty and we know that we're broken and we know that we need healing and and a Savior, but Jesus' blood was different. Jesus' blood wasn't like the lamb of a bull or a goat. When Jesus went to that cross, for real, for real, God wiped your sin away. 
That's why I say sin is not your problem. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus right now, it's not because of sin. If you don't have a connection with him, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, if you leave this life and go to hell, it won't be because you sinned. It won't be because you were a sinner. It'll be because you rejected to pull the doggone parachute cord. You're falling, all of us. You're not like anybody else. You're just like me. We're all in a free fall. But the good news is that you already have a parachute. All you have to do is pull the cord. Say yes to Jesus. He's already paid for sin. I want to invite you. In fact, I'm going to do it differently than we do every week. I want everybody to take your phone out. I want to invite you to make a quality decision about Jesus once and for all. And I want all of us to respond to this, whether you've been saved for years and years or you're ready to make that decision today. Or maybe you like, I heard the pitch, sound good, but I'm good. I want everybody to respond to this. Take your phone out. We're going to put a QR code on the screen. If you don't want to use the QR code, you can actually text. You can text I see decision to 97000. I want everybody to do it. Text I see decision to 97000 or just use the QR code. When you send that text, it's going to send you back a menu of options. One, two, three, four. Number one is for people that say, listen, I know me and Jesus, we good. I'm saved. I'm thankful. I'm all set. I'm already in a real relationship with Jesus. Select number one or re reply with one. The A, B, C, D, I'll give you A, B, C, D with a, it, with a physical card if you don't have a phone in, in just a moment. In fact, if you don't have a phone and you'd rather not use your phone and you just want to get the car, raise your hand. We got ushers. We'll give you one right now. I got one person here. I got a couple people over there. Just go ahead and get them the car. So when I'm telling everybody else to, to reply one, you know one equals A. So you're going to reply. You're going to put A on your card. But on the phone, I want you to say one if you're already in a real relationship with Jesus. Reply two if you're ready to begin a relationship with Jesus. On the card is B. Do this at home. Do this here in the room. Reply, B, I'm ready. Or reply, two, rather. I'm ready to begin a relationship with Jesus today. Reply, C, if you like, listen, I'm thinking about it. I'm still studying some other religions. But I, but, I, but I like what I hear about Jesus. I just need more time. Then reply, number three, in your text or put C on that card. I just want to take some more time to consider. I will say this real quick. I want you to just be honest if that's where you are. But I will say, since we're all in a free fall, you really don't know how close you are to the ground. And there's a certain period of time that you have to pull that cord or it doesn't work anymore. Don't take the chance that you're closer to hitting rock bottom than you knew you were. If you know Jesus is really who he says he is, then respond to him. He's not asking you to pay for your sin. He already did that. He's just saying, use your faith, believe in me, trust me to make your life new. If you say you're not ready, go ahead and reply three or put C on the card. And if you're somebody to say, I heard the pitch, I'm good. I like church people. I like coming to celebrate Easter and all of that, but I'm not ever going to be saved. Then reply D or reply number four on your phone or D on the card. The reason I want you to still fill it out, we're not going to call you and text you and badger you and come to your house, knock on the door and give you the pitch again. We're not doing none of that. What I am going to do, I keep these cards, and now that we're doing it as a text, I'm going to keep those things all year. I'm praying for you. And the reason I'm praying for you is because the thing that leads people to turn their life to Jesus when they used to be a D, where they did not believe, what causes us to turn is God being good to us. So I'm praying this one prayer. God, would you just blow their mind with your goodness, that they can no longer deny that you're real and no longer deny that you love them, and your goodness lead them to repentance. That's what I want to pray. If you don't believe in prayer, it ain't going to do you no harm anyway. Give me the honor to pray for you. Do you know so many people that used to be atheists, used to be agnostic, used to say that they don't believe? They are born-again believers now because somebody prayed for them. Give me that honor to pray for you. So go ahead and respond if you haven't already. If you want the card and you haven't got one yet, you can raise your hand. Most of us did it on our phone. I want to pray for those of you that are in the second category. I'm ready today. I'm done with playing. I, maybe you've had religion your whole life. People were to ask you, hey, what's your religion? You said, I'm a Christian. 
But if they were to ask you who's been running your life, you'd be like, me, I run my own life. If you're somebody that Jesus has not been running your life, you need to get saved. You need to give him your life. Give him the permission to run things in your life. And if you do that, man, what he can do with your life will blow your mind. If you're somebody that you're ready, you text B or you text number two or you put B on that card. I want to pray for you. We're all going to pray together. And I want you to mean these words from your heart. Because the Bible says that if we confess Jesus as Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. It doesn't give us a long list of stuff that we have to do. Just confess with your mouth that he is, he is really the chosen one. And believe in your heart that he's no longer dead, that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Repeat this prayer after me. We'll all do it together. Heavenly Father, I believe for real Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross. Paid for my sin. Wiped it away. I'm so thankful. I give you my life. I believe God. You raised Jesus from the dead. And there are so many dead things in my life right now. Just like you raised Jesus. Raise these dead things in my life, God. I give you my life now. I belong to you now. I need your help. So I receive your spirit to lead me, to guide me into the truth. I thank you. Based on your promise, I fulfilled the requirement because I believe in you. I confess you as Lord. So I'm rescued. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. And I'm so thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you clap it up for those that made that choice? Oh, my goodness. You will never pray a more important prayer for the rest of your life. That's the most important prayer if you meant that from your heart. Let me tell you, the God and creator of the universe was on the edge of his seat just waiting for you to finally say yes, finally surrender. The best really is yet to come, and we're so happy for you. I got a gift for you. We want to give you a, a book called a Fresh Start book. And the Fresh Start book is something that we wrote so that it would give you a step to take for the next seven days. Monday, what do I do? It's going to give you the step. Tuesday, what do I do? Very short book. You'll finish it in the next seven days. Having taken those steps, you'll be better for it, I promise you. We're giving it to you as a gift. You don't have to sign up or register or anything. Just on your way out the door, if you're here in the room, on your way out the door, we'll be waving it. Just grab one of those books. If you're watching online, when you text B, we actually sent you a link to get a download of that free uh, Fresh Start book. So you'll get an e-copy of it. Read the book. It will make the difference. Um, the other thing that we have is a, a new thing we started is a small group for people that are new to the faith. You new to walking, like living for real, for real. Not just talking about being a Christian, but you really trying to go for it. You need a new community. And so we started a small group that meets here at the church at 10 a.m. every Saturday for people like you that want to just meet some new people and get serious about walking with Jesus. And then we also have another small group that we started this semester that meets at 1030 at the church called a freedom group. And this is where people are like, I've been saved, but I still need some community. I still got some stuff in my life that don't look like Jesus, and I'm trying to get free of some things. So 1030, we have that freedom group as well. I encourage you to take advantage of either of those. I just want to say happy Easter to you. Congratulations to those of you all that gave your hearts to Jesus. I love y'all. I'm going to see y'all next week is 9 and 11, so don't show up at 10. You'll be late for one and early for the other one, all right? I love y'all. Give it up for Pastor Sean. Let's give those folks a big hand, everybody. The best decision that I have ever made in my life when I gave my life to God. Is anybody in agreement with that this morning? So we have come to the part of service where we celebrate God through our generosity and how we show our generosity to God here at Impact Church is three ways. Number one is through our time. Number two is through our talent. And number three is through our treasure. And what I mean by your treasure, I mean your giving. And listen, Impact Church has it. We are and continue to be a very generous and a giving church. So I just want you to give yourself a big hand for that. Y'all can do a little better than that, y'all, because listen, when you give, some of you folks may be new and new to the ministry, but listen, 
Impact Church is making a big, huge difference in the community. Lives are being changed, and people are getting to know that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. So that's a big, big thing. So appreciate you all for that. Now, if you're new to the ministry, please, by no means, there's no pressure to give. If you feel a prompting in your heart to do so, by all means, follow that. For those that call Impact Church your church home, there are two ways in which we give. The most common and preferred way that we give is digitally. That's via cash app, text to give, as well as give online. And if you scan the QR code here over to my left or to your right, if you're watching on uh, in front of me here, um, you scan that QR code, it's going to take you directly to the website, and you can set that up from there. Now, what I want to do is the other way in which we give is via envelope. If you want to give by cash, check, or money order, we have an envelope that should be directly in the seat pocket in front of you. And if there is not one there, you raise your hand and one of our Dream Team members will give that to you. Now, we don't have offering buckets or trays that we pass out uh, for the offering. As you exit, if you're giving via envelope, as you exit on either side of the door, there will be there a um, offering receptacle. So please take, drink, take that offering and drop that in the offering receptacle for us. We appreciate it. There's a scripture I want to read for you. It's in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 22 and 25. It's in the New Living Translation. It says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So the way I look at it is this. That spoke to my heart because if you're a person that's that's a generous giver, just know this. That's a, that's a Bible scripture that God established as a covenant. It comes back to you. You give and it comes right back to you. So I'm a true witness to that in my life. Anybody else can agree with that? That was kind of weak and anybody else agree with that. Amen. So with that, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord God, for the offering that we received today. I thank you, Lord God, for each and every person here within the sound of my voice, Lord. If, if they choose to give or those that do not, we, we thank you for them anyhow, Lord God. And thank you for blessing their life, touching their life, Lord. And the word said is that as we give, Lord God, that, Lord, we'll be blessed as a result of it. Let you will refresh us, Lord God. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, if you're in agreement with that prayer, what do you say? Amen. Amen. Got a couple points here before we close out. Number one. If you are new to the ministry, there's a connection card that's in the seat pocket directly in front of you. Please take a moment, complete that, and once you exit out today, there's a welcome center directly out the exit door. You're going to get one of our impact swag bags. Please take that completed, completed card to that desk, and uh, one of our Dream Team members will get that to you. Next, if you made that fresh commitment to God today, committed your life to Christ, as you exit out the door, there will be our Dream Team members holding the Fresh Start book there. Please take the booklet. It's going to bless your life as well. Three, we have some refreshments as you exit out today as well. So please get some refreshments, family. We took a lot of time to get those and a lot of preparation. So please partake. Lastly, if you are in need of prayer, please come to the front. There will be someone that will pray with you. You all have a blessed and a restful Resurrection Sunday. Love you all, and we'll see you next week.